Peanuts has always held a soft spot in my heart. I think it's one of the most critically introspective stories ever conceived, and the fact that these crushing self-reflections are expressed through the mouths of babes makes it all the more biting. Charlie Brown and the gang have been around since 1950, almost 70 years at this time, and while the strip has been retired since the year 2000, these colorful characters still endure. While Charlie Brown is undoubtedly the titular character, you can make a convincing argument Snoopy is its most popular. In an article with Slate Magazine, Jim Davis, the creator of Garfield, stated that Snoopy was a boon from a marketing standpoint, which inspired him to center his comic strip Garfield around a cat. Davis says, Snoopy is very popular in licensing. Charlie Brown is not. So naturally, it would make sense for Snoopy to get his time in the limelight, leading to 1972's Snoopy Come Home. The second theatrical Peanuts film, ninth if you count the TV releases, Snoopy Come Home, written by series creator Charles Schultz, finds us following Snoopy as he leaves the comforts of his life with Charlie Brown to pursue someone from his past. It's a strong premise, starring possibly the most popular character of the franchise, but surprisingly, ends up as the saddest and most ruthlessly depressing of all of Charlie Brown's adventures. And for something Charlie Brown related, that's saying a whole lot. So how did this come to be? Let's find out and jump into Snoopy Come Home. We begin with an opening credit sequence, and you can tell by the colors and style, it's from the 70s. I mean, it's as 1970s as wood paneling. In this intro, we get the main title theme, Snoopy Come Home. It's a mix of upbeat and haunting. I've never been a particular fan of that style of choir music, think California Dreaming by the Mamas and Papas, but I don't dislike the song either. It's just not a happy song, but that's apropos since this isn't a happy movie. I love the brass work though. The trumpets and trombones make this movie feel bigger than any Peanuts movie before it. In the 2011 interview, producer Lee Mendelson stated, everybody felt that the first movie had too much the feel of the TV specials. We collectively thought that we needed more of a feature film look and score. That's why we went to the Shermans, who at the time were number one in their field for such things. And on paper, this decision made sense. The Sherman brothers were siblings who had worked primarily with Disney, writing for various films including The Jungle Book and Mary Poppins, for which they won an Oscar for Chim Chim Cheri. On paper, this is a no-brainer decision. Hiring two of the most successful songwriters for animated children's films was as good a move that could be made, for 99% of cartoons. But this is Charlie Brown, and trying to make this property into a musical that's not on Broadway seems uncharacteristic to the brand, which we'll talk about more later. During the opening credits, we see Snoopy interact with the rest of the Peanuts gang. It's fun to see Snoopy's relationships with the other kids. He kicks Charlie Brown, steals Linus's blanket. It's a good way to introduce something familiar directly from the strip to the screen. The movie begins with Charlie Brown and Linus at the beach standing on the shore. Charlie Brown throws a stone into the ocean and disapprovingly, Linus says, it took that rock 4,000 years to get to shore and you throw it back. To which Charlie Brown replies, everything I do makes me feel guilty. From the first line of the movie, you know you're in Charlie Brown's world. And that's where the real strength of the humor lies in Charlie Brown. The things that you found funny as a kid the kite-eating tree, getting your clothes knocked off by a baseball, all the physical things are all just cosmically veiled conveyances of the failures we experience throughout our lives. What I find funniest now though, are the reactions people have to Charlie Brown's normal behavior and thoughts. Just the cruelty of the other children and how it leads to Charlie Brown wondering if there's something wrong with him. And there's plenty of that in this movie. The beach adventures continue with Snoopy meeting up with Peppermint Patty, having a fun day and agreeing to meet back the next day for a picnic on the beach. Back at Charlie Brown's house, the kids are all playing Monopoly. And this is where, again, it's really funny just the way these kids talk to each other. Peanuts is so good at inserting these adult ways of speaking through kids. 
You feel that they're at an age where you can see their personalities are developing into the people they're going to be when they're older. As the evening sets, Snoopy rolls in and Charlie Brown complains that Snoopy is too independent and that the pet would be nothing without him. Even the collar on his neck is because of him. In response to this, Snoopy offers up his collar and Charlie Brown promptly shuts up. Cold-blooded move. The next day, Snoopy makes his way to meet up with Peppermint Patty, but as soon as he steps foot onto the beach, he's kicked off, a no dogs allowed sign having been erected overnight. This is where we get our second song titled, No Dogs Allowed. It's an entertaining number that fits the situation. It's just a few seconds long, but it gives this disapproving demeanor against Snoopy that carries throughout the film. Irked, Snoopy returns to his doghouse and dictates a stern letter to Woodstock, who makes his first on-screen appearance ever here. I like the sounds the two animals make as they speak back and forth to each other. And at the end, Snoopy signs it with his paw print. It's a nice touch, and that it looks like a real dog paw just ups the adorableness. Afterward, Charlie Brown, Sally, and Snoopy go to the library. Sally complains she doesn't want to learn to read, she just wants to be a good housewife. It's a funny line considering how times have changed. And if you really want to see how this movie's been dated, look at the selection of books Sally checks out. I'll just say that this movie was made in a long, distant past. Snoopy picks out a book titled The Bunnies, and he has a great laugh at it, cracking himself up to excess. And that's a book I've always wanted to read. Haven't there ever been certain foods or other things in movies and TV shows that characters enjoy that don't actually exist? Like in Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin's favorite bedtime story is Hamster Huey and the Gooey Kablooey. And the veracity with which he wanted to have it read to him before bedtime every night and how mad his dad got that he never wanted to change things up made me want to read it just as bad as he did. It's a shame the bunnies didn't exist though. I would have loved to have had that same laugh as Snoopy. Snoopy gets kicked out of the library for being the only person there to actually enjoy reading, I'm assuming, to the tune of No Dogs Allowed. So in a mood, Snoopy goes to Linus to use his blanket, but instead of asking for it, he rips it away from him. And the next two minutes, they really get into it, hitting each other in different creative ways. And there's some really, really laugh out loud moments here. Like when Snoopy stomps on Linus's foot and there's a great crunch sound effect and Linus's wails are so pained, it's too funny not to laugh at. And it's comical how undeservedly violent and angry Snoopy is. Snoopy walks away and encounters Lucy next, who's practicing boxing. Snoopy puts a glove on his nose and the two of them box with Snoopy kissing her at the end. These two scenes are very Snoopy and Peanuts, but they also feel like they're kind of here to fill time in an already short 80 minute movie. Next, we pan over to a hospital where we see a little blonde girl in a hospital bed. It's unexpected and I'll admit, I got worried. Charlie Brown can be a melancholy world. You throw a child in a hospital bed, just how dark are we planning on getting here? We see her writing a letter and before she sends it, she cries. During this, we get another stirring song. Again, it's not bad, it's composed well, it's just so solemn. The letter gets to Snoopy, who immediately packs up his suitcase and bowl and hits the road with Woodstock. We get another song, The Best of Buddies, and it's a peppy, upbeat tune, fitting well with their track. Meanwhile, back at home, Charlie Brown reads the letter from the girl at the hospital, who says her name is Lila, and she's been very lonely in the hospital for the last three weeks and would like Snoopy to visit her. Charlie Brown and Linus walk around with Charlie wondering why Snoopy left. Linus suggests Snoopy needed a vacation. Life with Charlie Brown might have been too boring and what would Charlie Brown have done as a dog owner to make him stay? But Charlie Brown says he never saw Snoopy as a dog. He saw him more as a friend. It's a touching sentiment, made more impactful since it doesn't seem Snoopy feels that same way. On the way to the hospital, Snoopy and Woodstock encounter a little girl who thinks they're strays. She's like Elmira from Tiny Toon Adventures. Her love of animals is obsessive and she thinks she's being affectionate hugging them, but it borders more on the line of accidental choking. She captures the two as she says to add to her collection. Yikes. It gives off a real no wire hangers or Kathy Bates in misery kind of vibe. And as she's bathing Snoopy, she breaks into song about being a sentimental gal. 
This seems like an appropriate spot to talk about the songs in the movie at a little more length. They're not bad. They're all composed beautifully. They sound great. But the transition to musical cartoon, where it's these characters singing a song, is odd to see. It wasn't the right franchise for this. And then they made the odd choice of not having any of the main Charlie Brown characters singing. The one song that is sung by a child isn't even addressed by name. We never get her name in the movie until the end credits. So how can the song be as impactful if we don't even know who's singing it? If you gave a song to Lucy, to Linus, even to Charlie Brown, it might come off as strange, but it would make more sense. The song the little girl sings called Fundamental Friend Dependability, it's just there to fill time, and you never want a song to feel like it's filling time. You want it to move the story along, but in this case, it just comes off as more of a forgettable song than anything else. After the bath, the little girl dresses up Snoopy in a dress, and then she spills on him, then blames him for it, and says she'll have to spank him. Oh boy, this is really going to Carrie's mother Dirty Pillows territory here. She takes Snoopy to the vet, where a big commotion ensues, and Snoopy manages to escape and rescue Woodstock. The two camp out, and while setting up their campsite, they whistle the Best of Buddies song. This is the most enjoyable version of the song. It's a fun little jam session between them that ends in laughter. See, this is more what I think the movie should have gone for. A light-hearted tone featuring these animal friends with the occasional pop-in from Charlie Brown. I really feel this vibe would have been more enjoyable over the course of an entire film. We check back in with Charlie Brown, who decides to go to the fair with Peppermint Patty. She tells him not to be in a mood, because no one likes someone in a mood, and that if you go around feeling sorry, you do it alone. Wow! It's just so interesting seeing how these approaches and views differ so much from how we see depression and sadness nowadays. Not that either is right or wrong, it's just so different. Next up is one of my favorite scenes, with Charlie Brown not even able to successfully have an enjoyable time at the fair. Peppermint Patty walks through the turnstile, but when Charlie Brown tries to go through, he gets spun around and falls to the ground dizzy. It's hilarious how truly pathetic he is. He proceeds to get sick on every ride, loses every carnival game. His existence is futile. Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty ride the Ferris wheel, and Peppermint Patty asks a question that I honestly don't understand. She asks, does your kind ever think about love? And Charlie Brown gets angry and asks, what do you mean? To which Peppermint Patty apologizes. I had no idea what that meant as a kid. I have no idea what it means now. What's the joke? Is it a race or religious or a joke about him being a boy or just a wishy-washy mess? If you know, please tell me because I've never been able to figure out what this subtle jab means. Maybe I'm overthinking it and missing the point, but seriously, if you get it, please impart your wisdom onto me. They then go to a fortune telling machine. The card it gives to Patty says, you are a very loving person and your life will be filled with romance. Charlie Brown is up next and I swear, the universe has pointed its finger at him and said, there you are. And in one of the funniest scenes, the fortune telling machine gives him a card and it simply says, forget it kid. It's one of those, life is so bad, but then even more gets dumped on and all you can do is throw up your hands and laugh kind of feelings. Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty sit down to eat some cotton candy and Peppermint Patty asks Charlie Brown, what is love? Charlie Brown explains what he thinks it is. He tells a story about how his dad owned a 1934 sedan and he would pick up this cute girl and go for rides in the car. He'd hold the car door open and he'd close it for her and when he got to his side of the car, she would lock the door and wrinkle her nose at him. It's a cute story and he says that's what love is to me. And I love this story. It's so simple, but you get exactly what it means. And I imagine maybe Schultz's father had this. It's a very real story. And to that she says, sometimes I wonder about you. What a vulnerable moment just stomped all over. Every single real moment that Charlie Brown has gets discounted and dismissed by everyone else in his life. And this is what Charlie Brown does better than maybe any other fictional world in history. 
I've never seen a cartoon and can't think of even a live action show that so mercilessly will drown the main character in disapproval for his thoughts and wants. We return to Snoopy and Woodstock who are going to sleep after a long day of traveling when they enter a dream state and walk through these painted shots in a dream sequence. They're very cool. Not surreal, but ethereal. Just the two walking in these painted paintings. This is what I want to see in a film adaptation of Charlie Brown. Do something you wouldn't normally do or be able to do in three panels. Snoopy and Woodstock arrive at the hospital and are greeted with a sign saying, no dogs allowed, that goes for birds. At this point, it's comical how ludicrous this all is. But they sneak in and Snoopy reunites with Lila and he does something you rarely see from him. He hugs her. Snoopy rarely ever shows affection in a sincere way to anybody, let alone Charlie Brown, so he must actually care about her, which is a surprising emotion to see him show. Back home, Charlie Brown and the other kids pace in a circle to the depressing Snoopy Come Home song. Each of them stops in their tracks to say why they think Snoopy left and that it was all their fault. Charlie Brown then tells Linus the story of how he got Snoopy. As a young child, he had a bad experience playing with another kid, so his mom took him home and the next day, they went to the Daisy Hill Puppy Farm and adopted Snoopy. It's another painfully honest moment that you feel is too real to make up. It's such an ordinary thing to happen, you can't help believe that again, Schultz went through something exactly like this. But of course, in Charlie Brown's moment of needing sympathy, Linus dismisses his story and says, people buy pets for strange reasons. Bury the coffin while he's still alive and in it, why don't you? Back at the hospital, Snoopy communicates with Lila, who we find out is Snoopy's original owner, bombshell moment, I know, that he has to return home. But when he leaves the hospital, he sees her crying in the window, and he runs back to her, indicating his intent to stay. Elated, she tells him to go back to Charlie Brown and settle his affairs. Charlie Brown sees Snoopy and is ready to celebrate his return, only to find out Snoopy's there to give away his belongings before he goes back to Lila permanently. So the Peanuts gang throws Snoopy a goodbye party, with each kid going to a lectern and saying their goodbyes to him. But these don't sound like goodbyes, they sound more like eulogies. With a heavy heart, we gather here to say our last goodbyes to Snoopy. He leaves us in the prime of his life. Does that sound like goodbye for now or goodbye forever? Oh, and did I mention that during this, Snoopy is bawling his eyes out and each presenter is crying as well? The worst is when Charlie Brown gets up. He hangs his head and can't even muster up the strength to say anything. He just looks down and begins weeping, making Snoopy cry harder and let out a yowl, and then Charlie Brown lets out a big cry sound. And how does this big group celebrate Snoopy's goodbye? Why, by gathering around the piano and sobbing hysterically, of course, and not even in a comical way. It sounds like somebody told these kids Santa wasn't real and that their pets ran away in the same day. It's four minutes of children weeping, and it's too much. Somebody make it stop. That evening, Charlie Brown can't sleep. And this is the most aching scene. Lying awake in bed, he goes outside to Snoopy's doghouse and rests his head against it. It's silent heartbreak at its finest. Another song plays in the background. And what can I say that I haven't said before? It's a good song, but it's not fitting for peanuts. I just can't make the connection work. We end with Charlie Brown pouring himself a bowl of cereal and then pushing it away, slouched over on his desk. It says everything without saying anything. The next morning, Snoopy arrives at Lila's family's apartment building where she's out now healthy, I'm hoping. But wouldn't you know it, there's no dogs allowed. The payoff here is exceptional as Snoopy excitedly heads back home. Snoopy returns delighting everyone until he gives one last letter to Charlie Brown saying he wants his stuff back from everyone or an attorney will seize it. That's a funny ending, as it immediately sours everyone's opinion of him. And at the end of the note, it says to Charlie Brown, since I gave you nothing, you owe me nothing. Now, I have some opinions on this movie. Let's start from my first viewings as a young kid. I like this movie. It was in a semi-regular rotation of tapes I would watch since I only had a few. And I remember thinking the story was of Snoopy being sick of getting thrown out of everywhere and everyone being mean to him, so he wanted to go to a place he'd be appreciated, but he benevolently forgave his friends and they all celebrated his return. But since I've seen it again for the first time in years on years, I've gained a totally different perspective. I believe 
This may be the worst version of Snoopy ever. He's angry, rude, selfish, unnecessarily aggressive, and is wholly unlikable. Snoopy falls into a category of characters that have seemed to gain popularity in more recent times. Characters who are extremely uncaring of how their actions affect others because of character flaws they refuse to work on for the most part, but instead of people calling them out on it, they shrug their shoulders and blindly accept that it's just a part of what makes their friend who they are. The two that come to mind as the best examples are Sheldon from Big Bang Theory and Abed from Community. They're these characters whose personality traits are destructive to not only them, but everyone around them. And we're supposed to feel bad because they can't help but be who they are. But it's convenient that they also don't do anything to try and change these habits. In this case, Snoopy is just as bad, if not worse than both of them. And it's a shame because there are definitely some aspects to the character I appreciate. I like when he's supportive of Charlie Brown and has his best interests at heart, but can be distracted by his own ego and fantasies. His characters can be fun too. They had a neat twist to the strips, Joe Cool and the World War I Flying Ace being my two favorites. I would say my favorite example of Snoopy is in the 2015 Peanuts movie. There, he genuinely wants to help Charlie Brown succeed, but his own visions of grandeur sometimes distract himself from his good intentions. I don't want to be critical of this movie without at least offering up some constructive suggestions. I came up with an idea of how to make this movie work. We're not going to reinvent the wheel, but I think it would make more sense and make the movie more enjoyable and consistent overall. The beginning of the movie would start with Snoopy not being allowed at these various places, the beach, the library, etc. But the Peanuts gang isn't sympathetic and tell him to wait outside. He grows tired of this and when he finds the note from Lila, decides to go to her. And during the trip, he encounters scary situations, maybe a bear, noises at night when him and Woodstock are camping. When he finally arrives at the hospital with Lila, she treats him like a dog, not an equal, walking him on a leash, making him sit on all fours while he's there, you know, dog stuff. But the Peanuts gang misses him back home and regret not appreciating him more. Snoopy resigns himself to living this dog life, but when Lila is released from the hospital and goes home to the apartment complex, it says no dogs allowed, so that way he fulfills his duty to Lila, but then he's able to go back home, having a newfound appreciation for his life, and Charlie Brown and the gang are happy that he's back as well. Like I said, it's not Shakespeare, but I think it could make for a better overall movie. So what do I think of the movie? Well, I think that's best said by who I'd recommend it to, which would be diehard Snoopy and diehard Peanuts fans. The casual viewer might get a kick out of it, they may not like it, but for the Charlie Brown diehards who love that darker edge, this is definitely the movie for you. Just get ready, because this movie is heavy. Easily the saddest Peanuts movie ever.